So uh, this talk is going to be about food for sure. And uh, when I uh, planned this talk, I uh, didn't realize that uh, it would be uh, a talk early in the morning. Uh, so um, after I learned about this, I changed the slide. Uh, take, take, I have taken out a lot of like, uh, uh, written material words and uh, replaced them with pictures so that uh, you don't easily fall asleep. Uh, I just flew back from New York, so if in the middle of a talk I uh, fall asleep, before you do, I apologize for that. Um, this talk is going to be about food, but I don't know whether or not uh, this will be an appetizing talk, because what I'm going to talk about is something that is quite disgusting. Okay, so I want to give you the pe forewarning so that uh, you are prepared for this. Now, um, I want to begin by telling you how in my profession, uh, I was trained as a social psychologist, how in my profession we typically try to understand culture. And then I try to offer you a different perspective on how we could understand culture. And this perspective is very much inspired by the complexity theory. And that's why uh, I think Yang uh, want me to share with you uh, about my research program uh, today with you. And hopefully, I will be able to get some um, uh, insights and uh, good feedback from the audience as well. So uh, let me begin by uh, telling you how the colleagues in my, professional, in my profession typically study culture. So um, a lot of the time, we believe that uh, people are socialized into their culture. So once they are socialized into the culture, culture is like a, uh, the operating system of the mind. So uh, inevitably, we'll be affected by the way we think, uh, uh, by the way to, uh, uh, we'll be affected by culture in the way we think, we feel, and we react. And uh, a typical way of understanding how culture influences our behavior is to compare cultures with very different mentalities and sociality. So here is the typical way culture is portrayed in cross-cultural psychology. And I use like two example, uh, two, uh, ex two cultures as example to illustrate my point. So here, you see are the typical characterization of American culture in the cross-cultural psychology literature. And here you see the other typical uh, way we characterize Chinese culture in the cross-cultural literature. So for example, we assume that uh, in American culture, the failure tends to be more individualistic, the emphasis is on independence, and uh, in Chinese culture, uh, the cultural values emphasize collectivistic uh, 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 goals and identity, and we focus on interdependency among individuals. Now, these are like uh, buzzwords that, uh, that you often encounter in cross-cultural psychology. But to illustrate how this works, as I mentioned to you, I have replaced a lot of words with pictures. So these are the typical pictures that we use to characterize Chinese and American culture. So this is Chinese culture. Cowboy culture is the, uh, often the, uh, uh, the, the label used to characterize American culture. Uh, this is another picture related to morality, the moral tradition in the two cultures, how people work in different cultures, how people need in different culture, how people socialize with each other and enjoy life in different culture. So for example, this is in Japan, so although they are doing very similar things uh, as, the, um, as uh, the, the, uh, the people here, the American people here, so what you see here is that uh, people help each other uh, and uh, they uh, care for each other, and here people are just doing their own thing. Okay, here is another stereotypic pictures or images of the two cultures, and I can go on and on. But uh, that's not uh, the message that I want to um, convey to you today. Uh, we are not ignoring that uh, there are important cross-cultural differences. But what we are trying to do is that uh, nowadays, when we look at uh, how people from different cultures interact, you will realize that a lot of time, people are not just representing their own culture. 
The reason for that is because cultures are moving across geographical territories through different media to people in different cultures. And people who carry different cultures are also moving around globally. So that what we see here today uh, in a lot of the cosmopolitan societies would be a lot of what we call culture mixing. Okay, so what is culture mixing? Well, um, a globalization scholar by the name of uh, Anthony Giddens used an expression to summarize, to capture the experience of culture mixing in everyday life. The expression that he used is experiential compassion of time and space. So what does that mean? That means nowadays, in a globalized space, what we are going to see are oftentimes co-presence of cultures or their symbols in the same space. And also, we may be able to simultaneously experience modern and traditional culture at the same time. So that is not a new phenomenon, but this phenomenon has become more and more prevalent nowadays with the acceleration of globalization. So this is a picture that I like. It was a picture that was banned in mainland China during the 2008 Olympics, but it has become very popular outside China. And what you see here are portrayal of a political leader in China holding a bottle of Coca-Cola, okay? And then you have symbols of communist China, and then the, the slogan here is red around the world. This is an advertisement campaign from Coca-Cola. And what you see here is an example of culture mixing. You see the past and the present. You see the Western and the Chinese in the same representation, in the same media. And this is getting more and more common. And uh, um, a week ago, I went to Colombia to work with my colleague, Michael Morris, uh, who is also a very eminent uh, researcher in culture and psychology. And uh, one of our goals at this uh, research meeting is to develop a new research agenda, which we refer to as polyculturalist psychology. And we are going to announce this new field in a uh, paper uh, that will be published shortly in the annual review of psychology. So what we try to do is we try to distinguish the approach that we take to understand culture, emphasizing more on the interactions among cultures and how people respond to interactions among cultures. And this perspective is different from the traditional way psychologists understand and analyze culture, which focus on very much uh, uh, on the differences between cultures, differences in the mentality and the sociality between people from different cultures. So the key word here is continual generative interaction between traditions, which is like the uh, uh, difference from analyzing culture as bounded independent entities. So when we said, okay, now we want to shift our focus of analysis to interaction between cultures or among cultures. So the first challenge, of course, is to understand what are the different forms of dynamic interaction between cultures. And uh, what I'm going to show you here is a table that I'm not going to talk about because it's too complicated. This is a complexity conference, and the goal of my presentation is to make complexity simple for you. So my goal now is not to walk you through these uh, very complicated tables that summarize different forms of uh, interaction dynamics. But I do want to focus on uh, a couple of dimensions that we consider to be quite important. So when we talk about interaction between cultures, we are talking about culture flow, inflow and outflow of cultures. And so when you talk about culture mixing, we're talking about how people we we add to different forms of cultural inflow. So, for example, nowadays, when you talk about cultural inflow, okay, so you have like your iPhone with you, you have like, uh, you probably watch a lot of Korean movie uh, and uh, soap uh, or TV uh, dramas. That is one of my, uh, one of the favorites of my wife. And uh, so that is one form of uh, culture mixing. You probably have encountered many like new technology from different parts of the world, you probably are 
uh, watch a lot of Hollywood movie and as well as Asian movies. That is also um, culture mixing. Now, um, when I talk about all these forms of cultural info, there are two dimensions that are important here. The first dimension is whether the culture that comes to you is considered to be a culture that is kind to you or not kind to you. Whether it is a warm culture or a cold culture. Whether it is a, the second dimension is whether this is a high status culture or a low status culture. Whether this is a strong culture or a weak culture. So how you perceive the incoming culture is going to affect how you react to uh, the culture inflow. Now, of course, culture, culture inflows can take place in different domains. One domain is the material domain, which is portrayed here, the materialistic domain. And the other domain is the symbolic domain. And then the third domain is the sacred and cosmological domain. Now, these terms are very abstract. Uh, and uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this one because today I'm not going to, my, my goal is not to walk you through the whole model, but to illustrate what a polyculturalist perspective is like. So what I'm going to do is to focus on this particular column here. So what is, what is this particular column? As I mentioned just now, there are three dimensions of cultural inflows that we are interested in. One is the perceived warm or coldness of, a, of the incoming culture. The second dimension is the perceived strength of the culture. And the third dimension is the domain in which uh, the cultural materials um, uh, fall into. So let's look at this column. What does this column represent? This column represents encountering a no status and uh, potentially hurtful culture. Okay? So what does that mean? Okay, that means, for example, okay, if somebody built a uh, Starbucks coffee shop in the Forbidden City in China, the Chinese would consider that to be something terrible. Okay, why is that something terrible? Well, that's terrible because it is an encounter of traditional Chinese culture with very powerful American corporate culture. American corporate culture is considered to be high in status by the Chinese consumers. And, uh, American, uh, and the Starbucks coffee is perceived to be a uh, contaminant, contaminant of uh, uh, Chinese traditions. So that would be an example of low status uh, High to high to uh, low status and to powerful uh, sorry uh, uh, high uh, uh, powerful high status uh, cultural input and uh, what we are trying to argue is that uh, when people encounter this kind of cultural info in the domain that is considered to be sacred in the culture they will experience a kind of psychological threat and that is what we refer to as contamination threat. When we respond to contamination, oftentimes the emotional reaction would be disgust. And we experience the emotion of disgust, what we will often do would be to purify the system by excluding the contaminant from our body. So again, let me illustrate with some example of this. So this is what happened in China in 2010. So if you go to Shandong uh, province, you will notice that one of the very important uh, cultural heritage sites there is the hometown of Confucius. And there's a Confucius temple there. And what happened in this incident is that uh, in year 2010, in, the de uh, uh, in December uh, 23rd, there was a plan to built a Christian temple, a Christian church, just a few kilometers away, three kilometers away from the Confucius temple. Now, that may not be very hurtful to the Chinese, but then uh, considering that uh, this Christian church is going to be taller than the Confucius temple, then think about how the Chinese will react to this incident. 
And uh, if you follow the reaction of the Chinese uh, to this incident on the intellect, you'll find out that these are the accusations they made about this um, uh, incident. So they said building a Christian church next to the Confucius temple is a um, behavior that signals lack of vision, lack of common sense, and also disrespect to the cultural tradition. Okay, here's one example. And here's another example, which I use a lot in my talk. This happened in 2007 in Beijing. And Starbucks coffee has a shop in the, inside the Imperial Paris Museum in Beijing. And then to, in, the, uh, in 2007, a very po uh, provocative to, uh, essay was put on the blog of a to, Chinese opinion leader. And that opinion leader argued that Starbucks coffee must be removed from the forbidden city in China. So why was Starbucks forbidden in the forbidden city? So the answer is, according to this provocative essay, Starbucks coffee is a symbol of middle class American culture. In fact, according to this, um, the writer of this essay, Starbucks is a symbol of me lower middle class American culture. And the Forbidden City is a symbol of Chinese culture. So the presence of a Starbucks coffee in the Forbidden City is forbidden because it represents a kind of contamination of Chinese culture. And so it must be removed from the Forbidden City. What happened is that after this uh, essay was posted online, hundreds of thousands of Chinese post a commentary on the blog. And most of them were supportive of the removal of the Starbucks coffee from the Imperial Paris Museum. And six months later, Starbucks was asked to move out. In fact, uh, they said they want, uh, they want here to move out okay, in order to minimize animosity. What I want to say here is that it's really not about having co a coffee shop in the Forbidden City that matter because after Starbucks moved out and other coffee shops moved in, okay, and uh, so it's not really about having a coffee shop there. It is about Starbucks as a symbol of American culture. So uh, here's another example that happened uh, again in China not long ago. This is a temple, it's a sacred temple, Buddhist temple in Hangzhou, China, uh, Lingyin Temple. And again, uh, what happened is that, uh, sorry, again, Starbucks coffee. Want to open a shop near the temple, okay? And uh, 2012, okay, September, that was the time when this happened. Shanghai Daily put up an uh, article and uh, with the title, Culture Debate Gets Hitted at Starbucks Opens Near Temple. And then uh, People's Daily Online published another article with a with title like, Why Can't Starbucks Night Be Signing Young Temple? And then uh, on the internet, there were pictures that show netizens, strong negative reactions to, the star, to Starbucks uh, uh, presence near the temple. And here are some of the pictures they post, okay? So this is the Starbucks copy near the temple, and this is the picture that they show. They show how a uh, Starbucks uh, employee offer free coffee, sample coffee, to a uh, Buddhist monk. And uh, so here is another example of um, negative reaction or disgust reaction to culture mixing. Well, this happened not only in China. This happened around the world, okay? Uh, in the France, okay, there are strong, mov uh, strong movements against McDonald's, okay, because they think that McDonald's represents some corporate American uh, values, okay, American corporate values that uh, actually is oppositional to the French values. And uh, this happened in New York. 
remember ground zero at 911. And uh, there were a lot of furious reaction by the Americans to building a mosque near nine, uh, ground zero. Okay? And uh, what I would want to argue is that uh, a lot of these reactions to culture mixing have something in common. And uh, what I would want to argue is that uh, the communality, the critical communality, lies in the domain in which this kind of cultural uh, mixing occur. And the domain is the sacred domain, or the cosmological domain. And another critical com uh, communality among all this reaction is that uh, all this reaction are driven by the emotion of disgust. And uh, oftentimes, disgust lead to anger and uh, as well as aggression. So let me try to like, uh, give you an idea of uh, how we understand sacredness. So in every culture, we hold something to be sacred and holy. And what is sacred is defined as something that is timeless and supremely meaningful, something of an entirely different order that, than ordinary life, something that is capable of taking the person outside of the self, matter, and mortality. So in every culture, in every culture, in every society, we hold some symbols to be sacred. So for example, in Christian tradition, you probably would, uh, uh, people, uh, Christians would hold the crucifix to be a sacred symbol, okay? The image of Jesus Christ to be a uh, sacred symbol. In Chinese culture, many scholars would hold the image of Confucius to be a sacred symbol, okay? Uh, and you can find this also to, in the other cultures in the world. And uh, not only do we have like, people who represent uh, the sacred values in the culture, we also have space they were considered to be sacred in every society. For example, in the United States, if you, go, uh, you visit San Antonio, you go to uh, uh, the Alamo there, you find out that uh, people hold that to be a sim sacred symbol of the, of the Texan cultures there. And uh, what you can see here is that, uh, for example, in this uh, building, you are not supposed to engage in any commercial activities. Okay, because that would be considered to be a source of cultural contamination by the people, by the Texans there. And uh, what we try to argue is that when a foreign agent contaminates what is regarded as sacred in the culture, members of the culture will seek to repurify the sacred space by resisting or expelling the info of foreign culture. That is an idea that uh, we would uh, want to test in the studies that I'm, I'm going to present to you. Now, another important con concept is disgust. So what is disgust? Why would we argue that uh, the reactions triggered by this uh, kinds of cultural info are disgust-related? So to understand what disgust is, we, I would want to show you a uh, uh, very interesting philosophical question posed by uh, some philosophy students in New York. So the questions they want to pose, uh, or they want to ask is whether disgust is just a biological reaction, or whether disgust is more conceptual. And they ask a very interesting question. So they said, uh, suppose you have to make a choice between two options, and you must make a choice. Which one would you choose? Would you rather eat pool flavor chocolate or chocolate flavor pool? Okay. So um, to make uh, this question more engaging, there are some clarification. Would the pool make me sick? The answer is no. It is purely, uh, uh, it's, pure, it's perfectly safe to eat the pool, okay, if you choose to eat it. Would it be human pool? The answer is yes. Would the pool really taste like chocolate and have the consistency and texture of it? The answer is yes. Okay. Would the real chocolate taste just like real pool and look like real pool? And the answer is yes. Would the real chocolate make me sick? The answer is no. 
And uh, will the pool be yours? Maybe. <laughs> okay. Now, if you find that, uh, well, this is a difficult choice, well, that means you are debating whether disgust is purely something to a reaction to the sensation, to the, to the perceptual sensations in your taste bud, or whether this is in your mind. Okay? Now, if you find uh, this option to be, uh, to be uh, more disgusting, and that is you want to eat uh, pool favored chocolate, that means you really cannot stand the idea of eating pool. It is in your concept. Okay? And if you choose this option, that is because you feel that uh, disgust, uh, you feel more disgust with the sensation. But I can tell you, if you ask people to make a choice, the speech is about 50-50. Okay? So disgust is something that uh, is both a biological reaction to our sen uh, sensory perceptions, as well as something that is in our mind. Here's an article published in Science that uh, discuss how the emotion of disgust is socially transformed. So originally, disgust is an emotion that you have when you eat contaminated food. Okay? And uh, the reason why you feel disgust is when you eat contaminated food, the smell makes you sick. You feel that uh, your body is being contaminated by the unclean food. And you have these psychological reactions to really like purify your body. So originally, that was a primary emotion in response to our sensory uh, experiences. However, this emotion gets transformed over uh, the process of uh, social evolution. And nowadays, we use disgust as a, uh, we also feel disgust when we encounter some social practices that we find to be disgusting. And what are those social practices? Those social practices are practices that challenge our sense of our conception of purity. Okay? And we even apply these concepts to, uh, to morality. So we believe that uh, there are some moral values we hold to be sacred. And because it is sacred, its integrity, its purity needs to be maintained. And once something contaminates this pure moral code, we feel disgusted. And then we want to do something to repel the contaminant and we purify the system. So that's the idea. I skip this. And then to go directly to the Starbucks coffee um, in the Forbidden City scenario again. Okay, in this incident, remember that, uh, well, there was this strong reaction by the Chinese against having a uh, Starbucks coffee in the Forbidden City. And in the original articles that proposed the removal of the Starbucks coffee in the Forbidden City, the writer made this claim. The Forbidden City is a symbol of China's cultural heritage. Starbucks is a symbol of lower middle class culture in the West. When I taught in America, the students got really angry with this statement because they love Starbucks coffee and they don't want to see Starbucks coffee as a symbol of lower middle class culture in the US. But nonetheless, that was what was written in this essay. We need to embrace the world, but we also need to preserve our cultural identity. There's a fine line between globalization and contamination. They're talking about contamination. But please don't interpret this as an act of nationalism. It's just about we Chinese people respecting ourselves. I actually like drinking Starbucks coffee. I'm just against having one in the Forbidden City. Okay? Here is the 911 uh, Ground Zero and uh, the, uh, con uh, the dispute over having a mosque near the Ground Zero. And this is an, uh, a quote from. Um, one of the uh, 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 people who advocates for the uh, um, removal of the mosque uh, from uh, 
ground zero. So this what I think that this is what uh, is interesting here. Uh, what it says is we must stop this mosque from being built at this location at all costs. The ground zero mosque is an affront to the American people, a symbol of Islam scoffing at us as they take over our sacred ground. Okay, it's about sacredness. Okay. So uh, let's look at some of the data that we have collected to test this idea. So um, this is in Singapore. And in Singapore, we have a lot of respect for people from different cultural traditions. So for example, Muslims practice the halal diet and consider that to be like, sacred and holy. And so in Singapore, in many canteen and eateries, we actually set up space to allow Muslims to consume halal food there. And uh, in this space, non-halal food or outside food is not allowed. Okay, but what if you bring halal food into those space? What will happen? Non-halal food into those space. What will happen? Now, uh, we dare not do this study in Singapore because we could uh, get into trouble. So what we did is we did in uh, Beijing. We did a study in Beijing and look at how the Muslims in Beijing react to different scenarios. So these are the different scenarios were presented to the participants, and they were Muslims in Beijing. So this is the, the husband of my, the, uh, my PhD student. He sacrificed for science, okay? So what he did is, now uh, he posed himself either as a Han Chinese or a Muslim Chinese, okay? By the wearing the, um, typical attires of uh, Han Chinese or Muslim Chinese. And then to, he's uh, having to, a meal here. And the meal could be a halal meal without alcohol or pork, or a non-halal one, okay, like this one. So what my student did is, she took photos of husband of her husband in a different setting, and then present one of these pictures to our participants who are Muslims in Beijing. Okay, and ask them for their reaction to what they saw. Okay, and uh, I go get back to this one first. The first things that uh, they asked is uh, she asked the participants is. How would you feel when you saw uh, when you see this picture? And uh, what you see here is, okay, if the participant said, "I don't feel anything," that response was recorded. And what you see here is that, uh, well, about more than half of the people in three of the four conditions report not feeling anything. And these are the conditions in which the Muslim saw a Han Chinese eating halal food, or a Muslim eating halal food, or a Muslim, uh, a Han Chinese eating non-halal food. Okay? So in these three conditions, the part most particip participants will say, I didn't feel anything. But when the participants who are Muslims saw another Muslim eating non-halal food, None of them said, I don't feel anything. They felt something. Okay, what did they feel? This is the emotions they report, anger and disgust. Okay, now, what, are, what, what uh, we measure next is their attitudes towards intercultural relations. So after seeing that picture, how would the Muslim Chinese respond to items like this? So these items are items related to motivation to preserve the purity of the Muslim tradition. So there are items like, I will not eat non-halal food. I will make friends with Muslims primarily. So what they are trying to say when they endorse these items is that I don't want to have any interactions with non-Muslims. I want to preserve the purity of 
my own tradition. Now, consider another set of items which measure the motivation to spread the Islamic traditions to other cultures. People who endorse this item would be somebody who want to spread the tradition of Islam to other cultures. And uh, what we find is that, uh, well, after the participants saw another Muslim eating non-halal food, their motivation to preserve cultural uh, purity increases relative to, uh, to other conditions. And it is only in these conditions that we saw this increase. But the motivation to spread the Islamic tradition to other cultures did not change at all as a result of seeing one of these pictures. Now, you may wonder why this finding is important, because this finding has important policy implications for managing ethnic relations in China. So in China, a lot of the time, there is this conception that the minority groups are not happy with their current situations because they feel that their tradition is not being respected. And uh, the Chinese government want to help the minority group to spread their tradition to other cultures. And so, for example, during the Chinese New Year, there will be shows that uh, feature or highlight the cultural traditions of different minority groups. The idea is, if the people there, the minority groups, feel that uh, they are being respected and that their tradition is still being spread to other cultures, then they will be happy. But what we see here is that uh, in the face of potential cultural contamination as a result of culture mixing, people actually want to be left alone. They want to preserve their purity. They don't want the Han Chinese to come in and uh, mess up with their tradition. That's what they want. Okay. Now, just now you saw some disgust reaction to culture mixing in the cosmological domain. This is a picture that uh, uh, my student took when uh, we were in uh, um, a, another very sacred Buddhist temple. And we saw this pilgrim who traveled a long way to this temple. But then he was paying with his iPad here. Okay, So that is another like, incident of culture mixing. But interestingly, when people saw him doing the paying with his iPad, people did not get angry with him. Instead, they find him to be amusing. So they want to take pictures of him, and they find him to be amusing. So the question is, what happened here? So just now, you saw some disgust reactions to culture mixing. But here, you don't see any. So what is happening here? So remember that uh, I make the argument that the disgust reaction would occur only when the, the cultural input happened in a domain that is related to the sacred values uh, in the society or in the culture. It will not happen if that does not happen in the cosmological domain. Remember the Starbucks in the Forbidden City? The Starbucks in the Forbidden City looks like this. Okay? It is Starbucks coffee, and uh, uh, the architecture of the shop is typical Chinese. And Starbucks coffee has a lot of difficulty in the, the Forbidden City. But similar Starbucks coffees tend to do pretty well in other cities, in other, even in other parts of China, or in Beijing. Say, for example, in Beijing, in Hohai, which is a tourist spot. You find a Starbucks coffee like this. In Shanghai, in downtown Shanghai, in another tourist spot, you find another Starbucks coffee there. And they're doing good business there. And no Chinese have any like, uh, difficulty with having a Starbucks -like coffee like this in the, uh, their town. So what happened? Well. I think the answer to that is these areas are not considered to be sacred space in China. Where is the Forbidden City is considered to be a sacred space in China? So indeed, if we look at all the symbols 
that uh, represents a culture. We can find out that uh, people will find uh, some symbols to be iconic, to be symbolic of their cultures, but uh, these symbols fall into different categories. So this is a study we did in China, and what we did is, first of all, we collect from survey studies what people consider to be things that symbolize Chinese culture. And then we ask people to sort all these items into different categories that make sense to them. So they generate their own categories, their own labels. And then uh, we analyze how this sorting was done. And we find out that uh, while uh, the Chinese tend to categorize all those symbols that uh, represent Chinese culture into three major categories. The first categories are objects that are related to the material culture. So example of this would be Ma Zhong, okay, uh, which is a Chinese uh, tile game. Okay? It is a symbol of Chinese culture. When you see a set of Ma Zhong, okay, you think about Chinese culture. But uh, they have nothing to do with any core value in China. It's just a material culture. And then uh, another example would be, uh, 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 say for example, here is Sichuan cuisine. Okay, that is also in the food culture, in the material culture. And then the second categories would be like uh, 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 things that uh, symbolize some kind of like uh, uh, values in China. Uh, we call this the symbolic domain. So, for example, Kung Fu, uh, tea cultures in China, that would be in the symbolic culture. And then uh, there are also some symbols that fall into the category of sacred symbols, like Confucius Temple, like the Qingming Festival, which is a festival for worshipping one's ancestors. Now, what is interesting is when you ask people to evaluate all these different symbols on different dimensions, you'll find that uh, there are systematic differences in the way they perceive these symbols. So for example, if you ask participants how malleable, how easily it is for you to change uh, the practices of engaging in those uh, uh, things related to the symbol, symbols that are in the material domain receive the highest score on fungibility. How about purity? How important it is to preserve the purity of those symbols, or what uh, those symbols will present? Then you find out that purity concern is the highest in the sacred materials or sacred symbols. Tolerance of to com contamination. How how much you can tolerate contamination of the uh, things were present by the symbols? Tolerance is the lowest in the sacred domain. So this is just to establish that. Uh, Symbols that represent a culture can fall into one of these three categories. And uh, so, what then? So we, we try to see how people will react to culture mixing in food. Okay? When, uh, different, when we put culture mixing in food into different domains. So this is pizza. This is Chinese dumplings. And this is putting a pizza next to a Chinese uh, a uh, some Chinese dumpling. This is even more creative. Creating a uh, Chinese dumpling pizza. Well, uh, when I was in Beijing, somebody took me to a restaurant that served Peking duck pizza. Okay, uh, that fall into this category. So we present this food to the participant. So the participants in Beijing saw one of these item, four items. And then uh, we told them that uh, this dish was introduced on one of the following occasions. The first occasion is a food festival. OK, so we told them that here is a new dish being introduced in the food festival in China. So when we do that, we put the culture mixing experiences in the material domain, all right? And then in the next condition, we told them that uh, we, this dish was introduced in a cultural festival. So when we said that, we put this, put this culture mixing experiences in the social or symbolic domain. 
finally, we told them that uh, this dish was introduced during the Qingming Festival in China, which is the occasion for the Chinese to worship their ancestors. I tend to be quite naughty most of the time, but on this particular day, I tend to behave because I know I have to behave because otherwise I'll be in deep trouble. Okay, this is a very sacred festival for the Chinese. So when we say, okay, this dish was introduced during the Qingming festival, that put the experience of culture mixing in the cosmological or the sacred domain. All right? And then we look at how the Chinese respond. And uh, in addition to uh, measuring the responses, we also measure whether or not uh, they consider themselves to be a culturally open or conservative person. So this is what happened. So when there is culture mixing, meaning that when the participants saw either the pizza together with the dumpling or the dumpling pizza, those people who were put in the sacred domain react really negatively to the pizza. And those who uh, were put in the material domain did not react very negatively. And this difference is particularly strong for those people who self-identify themselves to be culturally conservative. All right? Now, what if you just show them a pizza or a dumpling? Nothing happened. If there's no culture mixing, nothing happened. Here is what happened when you do not, uh, when you just show them a pizza or the dumplings. That means this is not about the pizza. It's not about the dumpling. It's about putting them together. All right? Okay. Now, let me show you another example. This study was done in China. What we did is we showed the participants one of the four pictures here. We told them that McDonald's is going to open a shop in the Great Wall. Okay? And we created four advertisements. In these two advertisements, we put the golden arch, the logo of McDonald's, inside the picture so that uh, the McDonald's logo is superimposed uh, onto the Great Wall. So for the Chinese, this is could be offensive because it is invasion of the sacred space by McDonald's. Now, in another condition, we put the golden arch next to the picture of Great Wall. Now, but what we did in addition to this is to manipulate what McDonald's will present by using a slogan like this. So in this condition, we said freedom, independence, American culture, all in McDonald's. So, what this did is to frame McDonald's as a symbol of American culture. And in the alternative conditions, we said, okay, fast, convenient, delicious, all in McDonald's. So we frame this into the, as a material, uh, McDonald's as a represent, represent, representative of the material uh, uh, culture in America. Now, you may wonder how McDonald's could be delicious. I don't know, uh, but the uh, Beijing Chinese can uh, relate to this message, okay? Now, and then uh, we measure a lot of things, but uh, mostly uh, it is about the reaction to the McDonald's. The participants saw one of the four pictures, and here is the results. When McDonald's was represented as a, uh, just a fast food company, restaurants, nothing happened. Nothing happened, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the participants actually were quite neutral about their evaluation of the McDonald's, regardless of whether the golden arch was superimposed on the picture of the Great Wall or placed outside the picture of the Great Wall. But when you frame McDonald's as a symbol of American culture, and you put the golden arch on the top of the Great Wall, the Chinese did not like it. Okay? Now, this happened also in America. What we did is we just changed the stimuli and test how New Yorkers respond to something like this or something like this, okay? And the results is identical. So when so the participants do not perceive uh, 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 Mao Qigong as a symbol of Chinese culture, well, they were not upset when you put a picture of him 
on the top of the Statue of Liberty. But when they perceive Mao Zedong to be a symbol of Chinese culture, communist culture, to be specific, then they got very upset when you put a picture of Mao Zedong on the top of the Statue of Liberty. So it's the culture mixing that matter. So if you put the picture outside, the picture of Statue of Liberty, it's okay. But they cannot be mixed. Okay? So the next thing we did is we want to further test how to powerful this mindset is. Thinking about uh, a symbol of another culture as a symbol in the material culture, a symbol in the symbolic culture, or a symbol in the cosmological or sacred uh, uh, culture. So what we did is we randomly assigned participants to one of the three experimental conditions. In the first experimental conditions, before they respond to our stimuli, we told them to think about and write a few sentences about something that they hold to be functional in everyday life and tell us why and how it is functional. So they put their mindset in the material mindset, functional mindset. And the second conditions, we told the participant to write and think a few, uh, write a few sentences about something they call to be symbolic in their daily life and tell us why it is symbolic. So this is a manipulation. We set up a symbolic thinking mindset. mindset. And then in the third conditions, we put the participant in the cosmological mindset. We ask them to think and write a few sentences about something that they hold to be sacred in their daily life and tell us why it is sacred. So participant who receive this manipulation would be having a, so will have a sacred mindset when they process the subsequent information. And after that, we present this case to them. That is the Starbucks in the Ningyan Temple incident and ask the participant to give us their evaluation of having a Starbucks coffee next to this sacred Buddhist temple in China. And what you see here is again the same story. When the participant will let to think about uh, the incidents from a more sacred perspective, when they adopt a sacred mindset, they become very angry with having a Starbucks near the temple, particularly among those who identify themselves as being culturally conservative. And if you put them in a material mindset, the effect will go away. People are fine. That means even for the same incident, if you change people's mindset so that they don't perceive that event to be an event in the sacred cosmological domain, they're fine, they're okay. But once you put their mind into, uh, or set their mind in such a way that they tend to perceive the whole event from a cosmological perspective, then they get very upset with cultural mixing. Uh, I apologize for uh, just showing you the Chinese stimuli here. This is another study that we did. So we told the participant that this is a study about uh, consumers' reactions to different books that are available in the market. And uh, the participant received one of the covers. Okay. And uh, what we changed in the different covers are just the title of the book. So what is the title of the book here? Chinese Improvement, uh, okay, uh, Improvement of Chinese Cuisine Based on uh, Western Cuisine. So that means, okay, what are the inspiration we can get from Western Cuisines to improve Chinese Cuisines? Okay, and here is the opposite. How can we improve Western Cuisine based on our inspiration from Chinese Cuisine? So these are culture mixing or culture learning in the material domain. Here is how can China, uh, Beijing opera be improved based on Western operas. And this is the opposite. Inspiration, of, uh, inspiration for Western op operas based on the Chinese uh, experiences. This would be in the symbolic domain. And this is the third uh, domain, the cosmological domain. And uh, that is how can Confucianism be improved based on Christian values? Okay, or the reverse, how can Christian values be improved based on Confucianism? So that is culture mixing in the cosmological domain. And the participant read one, uh, received one of this like, book cover, and then they were asked to evaluate how much they liked the book. 
notice that uh, again, these participants were from China, and what you see here is that uh, in the material domain, it's perfectly okay. But in the cosmological domain, they get really upset. And they get upset not only for the improvement of Confucianism based on Christianity. They also get upset when they receive a copy of the book that says improvement in Christianity based on Confucianism. So that means they cannot really mix the two. Okay? And uh, this effect is particularly strong for those people who are culturally conservative. The next thing is, again, we use this mindset uh, manipulation uh, to put the participant into a material mindset, symbolic mindset, or cosmological mindset. And then after that, we present to them the case about uh, having a church near the Confucius temple, which is taller than the Confucius temple, and see what they happen. And again, what you see here is that when you put them in a sacred mindset, they hate it, particularly when they were culturally conservative. But when you put them in a material mindset, they are less angry with it. Now, what does this tell us? This tells us that it is not the culture mixing itself that caused the problem. It is what kind of mindset we use to interpret the, uh, the culture mixing that matter. So once we interpret the event as one that is related to the intrusion of foreign culture into our own sacred space, then we act very negatively to it. Now, the next thing that I want to show you is how sacredness actually play a role in the, uh, our uh, responses to culture mixing. Now, um, I might not be very serious when I was giving the talk just now. I want to talk about something more serious, meaning of life. Okay. So what does sacredness, uh, sacredness do for us now, um, there is a phenomenon called mortality salience. What does that mean? That means human beings are unique in one way, and that is we are capable of imagining our future. And because we have this capability to imagine our future, then uh, we can imagine our mortality as well. You can, we can uh, imagine that one day we are going to die regardless of how accomplished we are. So in academia, we have a saying, publish or perish. But the truth is, regardless of whether you publish or not, we all perish. Now, once you have this awareness, you experience something that we call existential anxiety you start to question whether or not what you are doing is meaningful at all. So if one day we kind of what we do, we are going to perish, what's the point of coming to this boring lecture instead of doing something more fun? What is the point of working so hard to get your papers published and to get your research done if eventually we are going to perish anyway? So that is what we refer to as existential anxiety. And uh, when I was in the United States, every day when I uh, went back to work, I drove by a cemetery. And that reminded me of mortality. I would die one day. And I could get very upset and discouraged when that thought come to me. Now, but life go on. Somehow, we manage to maintain our motivation to work, to learn, and uh, to be successful. So how did that happen? That happened because of another way unique cap human capability. And that capability is that we could imagine ourselves being immortal, symbolically. And that is, we can imagine ourselves being remembered by our colleagues and our students and people we have inspired even after we die. So even though physically we perish, symbolically we live on. 
okay? So that's the idea. And uh, so, in a way, culture is provide a mechanism for us to deal with our existential anxiety. And for that reason, in every society, we would try to immortalize some individuals, particularly individuals who are perceived to be good members of our society, of our cultures. And we want them to be symbols of the immortal and uh, sacred values of our society. So that we feel that by living up to the standards of the society, of the culture, then we can experience symbolic immortality. And that's why in every culture, we have heroes. We have uh, cultural representatives that are believed to be immortal, symbolically, after they die. After uh, they die, right? And I'll skip these uh, worthy things and uh, take you directly to a study in which we test this ideas. So one way we can uh, make people experience existential anxiety is to tell them that they are going to die and ask them to imagine what will happen to them physically at the moment they die and after they die. Right? And uh, that's what we did. And uh, in the control condition, we put people into an equally painful condition. That is, ask them to imagine what will happen to them when they have their dental work done. That is also anxiety provoking, but not uh, a kind of experiences that you evoke uh, existential anxiety. And then after they have done this, we show them pictures of um, deceased Americans. These are all famous Americans. And the participants in this studies were American students. So you may recognize uh, many of the names here. Okay. And uh, they were selected because according to our past studies, all Americans can recognize them to be famous Americans. And then to, for each Americans, what we did, uh, for each uh, famous people here, what we did is to ask the participants to answer two questions. The first question is, for how long do you think these people will be remembered from today on? And how would they evaluate how much the, these people uh, represent American values? These are the two questions we ask. And here is the results. So each circle here will present an American, a famous American. And this is the estimate years uh, that uh, this American, this famous person, would be remembered from today on. And on the horizontal axis, this is, uh, it would be how representative that famous American is. So the blue circle will represent uh, uh, the control condition, and the green circle will represent the mortality salience conditions. Now, to give you one illustration of this, this is Lincoln, okay? This is a Lincoln in the mortality salience condition. This is Lincoln in the control condition. So in the control conditions, when the participant were asked to think about the anxiety that uh, they would get from doing the dental work, they estimate that uh, Lincoln would be remembered for another 1,000 years. But when they were reminded of their mortality, they believed that uh, Lincoln would be remembered for another 4,000 years. Okay? Let me show you another picture. Luther King, Martin Luther King. Again, in the control condition, people ex expect him to be remembered for another 800 years. In the mortality saving conditions, people expect him to be remembered for another 2,500 years. That's a big effect. And uh, this is just the regression line we, uh, we're presenting the data. Now, how about people who are still alive? Okay. If you ask them how long do you think these people would be remembered after they die, and how much they represent American values, and you pick people like this who are still alive at the time the study was conducted, you get exactly the same pattern. And that is, for example, Bill Gates. Okay, this is how many years Bill Gates will be es uh, is estimated to be remembered in the mortality salience condition, 600 years. Not bad. But <laughs> Bill Gates would be depressed when he knows that uh, in, the condition, uh, in the control condition, he is ex expected to be remembered for only another 200 years. Let me show you the data of another Bill. 
Bill Clinton, the same story. Okay. Now after I did this study, every time when people on this list die, I receive a lot of uh, calls from the media, asking me questions related to how many for how many years these people would be remembered. And uh, of course, you will see Michael Jackson here. And that's the, the time I got a lot of media attention. Now, remember Woody Allen? This is what he said. I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve it through not dying. But that is impossible. Now, how does this relate to culture mixing? So what we did in a study is, again, we uh, manipulate existential uh, anxiety by using this uh, mortality salience manipulation. And uh, after this, we present this case to the participants, and the participants were American uh, students. And uh, what we told them is that uh, Nike is going to expand their business in the Middle East, and this is the new advertising campaign. So what, uh, the new, in the new advertising campaign, they will use a new brand name. So instead of Nike, they have this new brand name, uh, which is uh, like the sportsmanship uh, in the English. And then so they would eliminate the logo, and then so they would uh, find a local soccer player to be the endorser, and then so this guy would be endorsing the uh, new brand with this uh, 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 slogan, dress modesty, the Islamic uh, spirit. And then so in a control conditions, we replaced Nike, which is not a sim, uh, uh, which was a, is a symbol of American culture, with another brand that have no connotation, no uh, symbolic value associated with uh, 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 the U.S. culture, and that is Porter Silas, which is a brand of toaster. A toaster. And uh, again, uh, the manipulation is to in, uh, in, uh, to to introduce culture mixing in the new advertising campaign, and. Uh, and then we have the participant write a message to support the campaign. And we just can't, how, we measure how enthusiastic they are in helping to, in writing the promotion message. And what we see here is that uh, if the product, if the brand is an iconic brand like Nike, putting people in a mortality salient conditions reduce their enthusiasm in supporting the campaign compared to like uh, uh, the control condition. But, if the brand is a non-iconic American brand, nothing happens. Finally, what we did is we manipulate mortality salience using the same manipulation, and then so after that, we manipulate sacredness perception. So in the sacredness condition, we ask the people to write down in the space below about the different reason why water can be considered sacred. In the control conditions, we ask them to write down in different ways water, how uh, water can be used and then uh, we told them that, uh, well, um, there is a, uh, a, a, a writer who writes against Chinese cult um, uh, US culture, and there's another writer who writes uh, uh, about the positive aspect of uh, US culture. And then we look at the extent of in-group bias the participants show. And that is, for these American participants, how much they like the writer who praise American culture more than the one who writes against American culture. And what we see here is this result. And that is in the mortality salience conditions, this is the control conditions, this is the amount of bias the participants participant, the participant show when uh, they did not receive this, they, they were induced to think about how functional water is. And what you see here is that uh, after they were told to think about how functional water is, then to existential anxiety make them support their own culture more. But what is interesting is, if you ask them to write about how sacred water could be, this makes them feel that uh, there is something sacred in life that actually took away the effect of existential anxiety people would now feel more comfortable accepting criticism of their culture. So what is interesting here is that uh, if you feel that uh, having some sacred symbols in our cultures 
is going to promote cultural conservatism, making people less reluctant to open themselves to new culture. That is actually not true. Those sacred symbols in a culture actually serve an important function that address our existential anxiety. And because of that, we no longer feel the motivations to protect the purity of our culture. And we are more open to other cultures. We are more open to criticism of our own culture as well. So that is the message that I want to uh, portray, uh, to share with you. Sacredness is a very interesting concept. Okay? In every culture, you have something that is sacred. And uh, sacredness performs a very important psychological function for human beings. And that is, it helps us deal with our existential anxiety. And once our existential anxiety is well managed, we become more open to cultural experiences. We become more open to cultural mixing. But once you attack the sacred symbols in our culture, once you create the perception that uh, the sacred space and the sacred symbols are being contaminated by foreign cultures, then we react negatively to those culture mixing experiences. So this is a very dynamic process. And uh, what I want to end here is that uh, all this program, uh, all these studies aim to illustrate one very important thing, and that is cultures are not just like bound systems. Cultures are constantly interacting. And at the same time, because cultures are constantly interacting, people respond not only to what happens in the cultural environment, but also respond to how culture interacts. And for that matter, I think the, uh, complexity, a complexity perspective on the evolution of culture would be particularly helpful and meaningful. Because now we are no longer treating culture as bound systems. Rather, we are treating culture as interacting systems. And then the next questions that we can we'll want to ask in this polyculturalist uh, psychological research agenda would be to see how the interaction between cultural systems lead to emergent properties that are not predictable from the attributes or characteristics of the individual systems. In fact, that is exactly what we are working on right now. So I probably should end here, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot. Uh, now you have the chance to increase your symbolic immortality by asking questions. <laughs> Thanks, Siva, uh, for your brilliant talk. I have a question about the mixer of uh, Christian church and uh, Confucius temple. Nowadays, a lot of scholars have pointed out that the idea, the idea of God has, mentioned, has been mentioned in many uh, Chinese Asian books, like Shang Shu, Li Ji, and Shi Jing. And even Confucius uh, himself said we should worship God and worship the heaven and all the pri priorities uh, of Chinese people are to serve God. So actually, uh, the ideology of God um, does not come from Western countries. So in the exi existing knowledge system of uh, current Chinese people, um, some people also think that God are uh, for all human beings and uh, God um, uh, has been the, the, the era of God has been passed from the Asian Chinese books. Uh, so, since the since there is already a mixing of you know uh, Christianity and the Chinese traditional culture, then do you still think Chinese uh, feel disgust for you know the the uh, Christian church and uh, uh, Confucius temple mix, mixing. And also, uh, if we spread this knowledge um, towards the uh, Chinese participants, uh, uh, so uh, we assume that they may know this knowledge about uh, God and Jesus and uh, uh, Chinese traditional culture, then do they still feel disgust? towards this kind of mixer? 
Wait, um, if I was not uh, clear just now, um, I apologize. Um, what I managed to say is not that uh, the mixing itself would cause the disgust emotion. It, in fact, uh, when you look at all this data that I present just now, first of all, the mixing have to be seen as a uh, intrusion of foreign cultural elements into the sacred space of one's own culture. And secondly, when you look at the data, you may notice that not all individuals would respond with disgust to those cultural mixing experiences. They would do so only when they self-identify as uh, people who are culturally conservative versus open. And indeed, uh, uh, Ying Yi Hong, uh, Paul Hong here, have done a lot of research on the individual differences in the way people conceptualize culture. And some people conceptualize culture as uh, a bound system with some essential qualities. And some people feel that uh, culture are constantly changing in responses to uh, in cultural interactions. And our data show that among those people who are relatively open to cultural experiences, they're less likely to show this disgust reaction, even when the, the, ex, the culture mixing experiences is framed as a, uh, a, a incident in which a foreign culture enter the sacred space of, the, um, of, uh, uh, of uh, one's own culture. So, so I want to, like, make, to clarify these two points. Now, um, and then to, one thing that I, I did not emphasize very much today is the positive outcomes of culture mixing. So remember that uh, at the beginning of this talk, I show you like a set of table, which looks really complicated, right? And I told you that I only want to focus on one column in those tables today and, uh, and, and show you how the polyculturalist perspective actually works. Now, there are other columns in the table, which I think uh, are equally important. And uh, some of those columns actually emphasize on the beneficial effects of cultural mixing. So in fact, cultural mixing is a major source of creativity in human civilization. And uh, say, for example, uh, the jacket I'm wearing is the result of culture mixing. Okay, it is created by appropriating ideas from different cultural traditions to create something new. And uh, when you like, uh, visit Singapore, okay, you'll find out that in Singapore, Singaporean chefs are very creative. They take advantage of the multicultural environment here they appropriate ideas from different cuisines to create fusion cuisines, which are really innovative. Now, so for a polyculturalist uh, um, uh, psychological agenda to be successful, we need also need to understand under what circumstances culture mixing can lead to this beneficial effect. And under what circumstances cultural mixing could lead to more culturally conservative responses. And, uh, what I can tell you is that uh, oftentimes when uh, people try to use other cultures as resources to achieve their valued goals, then uh, they tend to show the more beneficial effects of uh, culture mixing. But when they try to focus on the, their cultural identity in intercultural mixing conditions or situations, they tend to be more concerned about the symbolic implication of cultural mixing on their own identity. So for example, once you put them into a mindset so that they focus exclusively on to what it means to be Singaporean, what it means to be Chinese, what it means to be American, what it means to be a Christian, then to cultural mixing experiences could potentially trigger some of the concerns that uh, I mentioned just now. So I probably should qualify my conclusion in light of the actually greater complexities that we need to deal with uh, in the culture mixing studies.
congratulations. I think this is one of the best uh, lectures I've heard for a long time. Uh, uh, because it's very relevant to Asia. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, what I really want to ask you is, uh, is there differences between age uh, 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 education? Because there are, there are views that the generation Y does not think that differently across the Pacific. But uh, uh, the older generation has much more imprinted on the, on the cultural and the sacred. Because yes. what you're really saying is that the, uh, the value system, universal values, uh, breaks down at the sacred level. Yes, fine. Uh, we don't have uh, data on age differences or generation differences, but we do know from other research that uh, as people get older, they become more, um, they, their, their, uh, their social circles tend to be smaller, okay, and uh, uh, they tend to interact more with uh, people in the same age cohort, and uh, uh, of course, when people get older, the issue of existential uh, uh, meaning become more important. Say, I'm speaking for myself, as I get older, I start to like, uh, think more about uh, what is the uh, meaning of life, okay, uh, and uh, uh, I always have the feeling that life is too short to do something trivial, I want to do something, accomplish something more meaningful. Uh, so it could happen that, uh, well, uh, as people get older, there might be this tendency to focus more on uh, finding meaning in life, and I would also feel that, uh, well, there are also systematic differences across dif uh, in different stages of economic development. So what you will notice is that uh, when people are still living under poverty, when they're dealing with problems of subsistence, they don't think too much about meaning in life, okay? But uh, when the society has become rich enough, so people start to reflect on, uh, well, uh, what uh, makes a happy life, and uh, aside from hedonic uh, happiness, they would be also thinking about uh, eudaimonic happiness, and that is what is meaning in life. And uh, what you see in many postmodern society is actually a shift from think thinking primarily in terms of material well-being and hedonic well-being to like uh, meaning in life. I would imagine that uh, uh, like these concerns about uh, uh, meaning in life would become more salient in those countries that have that is mature enough to really like, think deeply about uh, uh, what is meaningful to do in one's life. Uh, but I think that is a very good uh, question. And uh, indeed, I do see that uh, there are also many other factors that would moderate the effects that I talk about here. But thank you very much for your question. One more? Yes, please. Uh, I'd like to address a question about uh, differences between uh, Western and Eastern cultures, uh, to what extent uh, 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 each culture is more able or less able to uh, absorb the cultures of others. And I uh, bring this in the context of complexity. Uh, I recall a study done by Richard Nisbet, and he wrote this book called The Geography of Thought, right. in which uh, you know, they found the Asian cultures much more able to look at pictures in a holistic way. Yes. Whereas uh, 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 European uh, Western cultures tend to look at one issue or the prominent, uh, yes. prominent issue. So if you extrapolate that into uh, the complexity sphere, well, Asian cultures look at the totality rather than just that uh, individual components, whereas Western cultures tend to look at things uh, in, in its uh, component. Now, uh, how does this uh, affect the capacity uh, of uh, Western and Eastern cultures to absorb each, each other's ideas? Yes, right. I think that is a, it's a very important question. And uh, um, uh, I know the literature on uh, holistic versus analytical uh, thinking across cultures, and you are absolutely right that uh, in Asian cultures, people tend to be more tolerant of contradictions. And uh, uh, I think that is in generally, uh, generally the case. Now, uh, we actually did some, uh, some agent-based modeling to see uh, well, uh, what kind of pattern would emerge when uh, people in the culture uh, are 
open versus not open to um, to other cultural influences, and also to uh, 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 how tolerant they are of ambiguity. And uh, what I can tell you is that uh, for from based on our agent-based models, uh, a major predictor of how likely a culture would accept influences from other cultures would be how open each individual agent is to other cultures. And uh, to the extent that uh, Asians are more tolerant of ambiguities, then uh, that might be like uh, uh, set the stage for, um, for culture mixing. But having said that, okay, we have a paper that is coming out that talk about uh, the really the par paradox of being holistic, uh, being a holistic thinker. And that is, suppose you have a thinker who is very tolerant of ambiguity. So what would this person be like in the context of culture mixing? So you expect this person to be able to accept ideas from different cultures. Okay, so, but at the same time, okay, well, when people are more tolerant of ambiguity, you will also expect this person to be less motivated to integrate the ideas, to come through the inconsistency between the ideas. So that means if I am a very flexible, holistic thinker, I can say it can be A, it can be not A, and both are fine. Okay. Now in that case, you don't see the integration of ideas. And then for creativity to emerge for cult from culture mixing, you actually need the integration. And uh, this could be one reason why in Asian societies, while we are more tolerant of the presence of different cultures, but there may be less motivation to integrate the ideas to form new cultural traditions. Now that is a hypothesis that I think that we can test uh, in our future work. Uh, so I would say each cultural tradition has its strength, but it could also have its weaknesses. And uh, so a polyculturalist perspective will encourage us to think about how we can learn from each other. Uh, I think to, uh, uh, people from Western cultures may learn from the Asian uh, traditions uh, in, to, um, in the way Asians can tolerate, tolerate a lot of conflicting ideas and thoughts in their society. But then I think uh, uh, people from Asian cultures could also learn from the Western traditions of trying to see how different traditions can actually be integrated and combined to gain new insights. So that, I don't know whether that answers your question. <laughs>